Okay, recording started. Okay, so this is the the um, monthly meeting on the APEC cycle for the Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group. And as usual, our meetings abide by the Kubernetes Code of Conduct, which inherits from the CNCF code and the Linux Foundation code. Uh, the meetings, as always, are recorded uh, and published. So if that bothers anybody, drop off now. Um, we've got one item officially on the agenda, and then anybody here is free to add more as time allows. And that was a project update on CubeEdge. So uh, Yin is here to do that. Sure, yeah, because my uh, the other maintainer is not here. So I will talk about that <coughs> first. Let me uh, share. Oh, please give me the co-host. So I can share. Yeah, and you'll have to do it because I don't think I have. Yeah, I, can you try now? I, I'll, I'll yep. load okay. all, all the participants. Okay, we can see it. Yeah, so, so I, because I think this material is uh, prepared for the SIG review and also all the people are not very familiar with Kubeedge because I think all of you guys, at least uh, for us in the, uh, in the meeting, are pretty familiar with this background, so I will... Yeah. Uh, why don't you pretend we're not? Because I think we get yeah. an audience on yep. uh, YouTube. So it would be better if we do this for even... Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, please chime in because we only have a small group. So you okay. can chime in to ask questions any time. But if you think that's uh, not need to <coughs> go very in detail, we can uh, skip or talk quickly. <coughs> so Kubeedge, so uh, when we design, it, we try to build on Kubernetes so basically we provide uh, the uh, fundamental or core infrastructure support for network, application orchestration, deployment, and also the metadata synchronized between the uh, cloud and edge. So the challenge we met is uh, uh, three major, uh, major parts. The first is network reliability and also the bandwidth. So uh, first is not, may not be reliable and is through the ISP internet, it could be uh, down at any time and the latency is unpredictable. The second is the resource stream on the edge, especially in the IoT edge. So when we met, it's, uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi actually is very generous already. You have a uh, Raspberry Pi so three, you have two gig memory, uh, four is four gig memory. But in some IoT gateways, it's uh, maybe reduced to a uh, 128 megabytes or uh, 64 megabytes and the ARM CPU running at a five or 600 megahertz. So very limited resource on the edge. The third is a highly distributed and heterogeneous device management for the IoT cases. Mm, yeah, that's all brand and all the IoT protocols involved. So the Kube Edge, so our implementation try to do this. First is a seamless cloud edge communication. So uh, I will talk about the uh, architecture later. So we communicate in the menu plan, we sync both metadata and the data. And uh, edge autonomy, basically we autonomous operation on the edge. So even the edge is disconnected at the from the cloud because the internet connection is broken, but the edge can still uh, run independently and manage the resource on the edge. And the low resource uh, ready, so we can have a minimum footprint on the, uh, on the edge. So we uh, save a lot of resource to, for the application. So the sum we, uh, in a small print, we can less than uh, 60, megabytes, even 400, uh, sorry, 16 megabytes, or even reach a four, 14 megabytes deployment on a small 
uh, on the small edge, uh, but you may compromise some um, some functions if you reduce to the very very uh, limit the minimum deployment. Then we have a simplified device communication. So from the communi uh, application, uh, that's for the uh, application device uh, for IoT and uh, industrial IoT cases. We support now we support MQTT protocol, but in the future we want to integrate other IoT protocols. Uh, architecture. So mm, we call is a cloud core and the edge core. That's the main part running, uh, main program running on the cloud side and the edge side. Uh, does start a, a web socket channel between the cloud and the web uh, and the edge, because normally um, there's sometimes and maybe a lot of times the edge running is behind either your home firewall or industry firewall, right? So uh, they don't have a public IP. You cannot access directly from cloud to the edge. In order to control it, we set up this channel. So I uh, initial the web socket from edge to cloud. Then through this channel, we can uh, manage the edge from cloud side. Then uh, we support, uh, I'm going to give a more <coughs> Uh, update for the 1.3 release. Initially, we uh, only support Docker. Then we support the CRIO, ContainerD, and the Kata container for security uh, reason. Uh, that's already um, supported in the 1.3 release. Uh, it's released in May. Uh, I will go over the uh, release notes for 1.3 release after this uh, presentation. And we work with the CNI. We work with uh, uh, Flannel net network and also Calico. That's all fully tested and other uh, network. Uh, also, we uh, work with the CSI Open uh, CSI, and we are looking forward to more integration with uh, the Soda. It basically still the Open SDS uh, Foundation. They rename it. And through Mosquito, we are. Uh, support MQTT protocols and for now. And uh, we have the that's device, device twin, device shadowing. Um, that's basically the architecture. Yeah, just ask me any questions if you have. Uh, Kubedge. Um, so Kubedge, as I said at the beginning, is a, it's an extension of uh, Kubernetes. We build on and leverage current Kubernetes uh, infrastructure and the code base provided for deployment. When when you deploy first, uh, uh, you deploy Kubernetes, then you deploy the uh, Kubedge component. So we're using the CRD to uh, uh, deploy here. So on the edge side, you can see we have the component basically uh, Edge controller, device controller, synchronization controller. Synchronization controller is for the uh, uh, metadata synchronized between the cloud and the edge. Edge controller is for the node management. Device controller is used uh, device shadowing to uh, can to manage and control device that connected to the edge node. Mm, the CSH driver for the uh, storage. Uh, the maintain broke. That's for the uh, API validation and the best practice enforcement. The Cloud Hub, there is the uh, connection open for the connection between the edge and the cloud. This is the uh, cloud side. In the uh, edge side, you can see in the next one, we have an edge hub to basically that provide a web socket connection between the edge and the cloud. So we have the event bus, that's for the MQTT client. Uh, then we connect to MQTT broker to connect to the uh, IoT devices. The HD is more like a, uh, more like a simplified uh, Kubernetes. So we still report the resource back to the master. However, 
as the reduced uh, amount and uh, frequency. And uh, we, we can, uh, in this, I think, yeah, this chart may be a little bit uh, early version. Now we also support a Kata container. So we uh, also support Kata, uh, Kata container from 1.3 release. Would you prefer questions now or should I wait till the end? Yeah, you can ask now. Okay, so um, at the edge, even though you, you said that this can go to edge nodes as small as 16 megabyte, but- um, No, we use the 16 megabytes, so we leave about- Oh, you uh, use, okay. Okay, okay, I was a little confused then by how you even had room to run things in Docker containers. Yeah, well, um, we use about uh, 16 megabytes, so we leave about 16 megabytes. So compare right. when we first developed that in 2018, so Greengrass used about 80 to 90 megabytes. So we significantly smaller than Greengrass. Okay, so you appear to be unopinionated on the container runtime where you can pick and choose from uh, many. Uh, have, is that based on users actually asking for all these different container runtimes? I'm just curious as to yeah, it's, uh, why you're from, doing them all. Uh, we ask, we got asked from the uh, customers. They said, okay, okay. Uh, we use the container D. We, can we just right. do support it? We said, okay. And right. uh, Kata is uh, we foresee people have a security reason mm -hmm. to running on. They said, okay, let's pick the Kata container actually. Uh, yeah. Because I think some of the other um, uh, distributions of Kubernetes designed for a small pro footprint and resource like you might find at Edge are a little more opinionated in terms of which container runtimes they're willing to support and have a more restrictive list than this. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all from the customer and the community uh, participants and they ask for that and they have a smart city. They said, okay, we have that container D, can you support or CRIO? Uh, I said, okay. How about the OS that it runs on? Are you opinionated on that as, in terms of what the you know, I assume that you start with a Linux of some sort. Yeah. Uh, does Cubeedge have an opinion on what that should be or provide it, or are you open on that? Uh, currently, we only support, on the Edge side, we only run on Linux, right? Uh -huh. And uh, we uh, already test uh, Ubuntu, uh, the uh, CentOS, that's all fully tested, and also the Raspberry Pi. And okay, the Raspbian? Yep. They're, they're all fully tested and we have uh, our community members that are running in their either test environment or production environment. Uh -huh. So running. I take it then it's tested on both ARM and x86 too. That's correct. Um, and with um, storage drivers and cloud providers for the edge, it would seem like maybe you don't use a cloud provider at all and remove it or? No, um, we don't have a cloud provider on the edge side. Uh -huh. So we only have, a, for the cloud, we only support the vanilla version of Kubernetes. Okay. So actually there's a member running on the AKS and the EKS, it doesn't work because mm -hmm. we uh, take over some node control and uh, conflict with, the, uh, with their management plane they refused, I mean, so. Okay, I understand. Failed. Not only that, one thing that might help you is that the Kubernetes trend is to go to these out of tree cloud providers and remove it out of the base Kubernetes anyway. So uh, there, there is a mechanism to externally uh, apply them. So maybe that would work out if somebody has a use case for doing it. And then for CSI storage, do you keep the entry storage plugins in for now or is it strictly CSI only? Uh, CSI only for now. Okay. And uh, actually the Soda Foundation, it's basically the, the old open SDS. Mm -hmm. they, they said they are going to, actually they offer, they build the old CSI drivers. I don't know if you are uh, familiar with their proposal. Basically they said, okay, uh, in Kubernetes, so each, storage, they need to develop their own CSI plugin, right? Right. So, but their proposal say, okay, they provide one uh, 
unified uh, mm -hmm. interface, all the CSS plugin, they are going to develop it. So in the theory, if we use their interface, they are going to provide the necessary uh, plugin, basically another layer below us. So connect to the old, uh, older storage. They even have the uh, plugin for uh, Azure yeah. storage, Google storage, even the S3. They said it uh, should be transparent to us. Right. If we okay, well, to that's network. interesting too, because it, uh, it contrasts to some of the other uh, low resource Kubernetes distros where I think some of them restrict some of the entries because they take space. Uh, but I think a lot of them leave in kind of generic ones like NFS that are co have common utility. So they don't necessarily strip them all. And uh, I'm not sure what the story is on their CSI support. In the longer run, you probably have to go to CSI just because Kubernetes itself is headed that way. But right now you could, can you have the option of doing both. Yeah, I think so. Because if you are losing, using the restricted the local uh, storage, that's another story, right? If you use a CSI plugin connect to a, you can attach to a network story. So it doesn't matter. It seems to me it will be a very large volume of storage you can attach yeah. to, right? It's at, at edge, you would think that maybe, you know, if you get beyond local and you need some storage that you can kind of the real generic things like NFS and iSCSI might be commonly found. That, that'd be my conjecture anyway. Yeah, I think that would be commonly found. And also uh, I'm thinking that's only for IoT cases, right? If you are going to MEC or, or large edge cases, that will be much popular, right? Right, uh, yeah, they'll the, probably the have an object store and a, be, um, a, a lot more. There's no telling what they might have in that environment. Mm -hmm. uh, for the CNI, the CNI, the network plugin, uh, I gather that that's open-ended too, that if Kubernetes supports it, that CubeEdge does, or is it more restrictive than that? Uh, we only test a few. Uh -huh. uh, actually, the Flannel, the Calatical, and uh, I could not remember the other one, but it's only the popular ones who already tested. It's working. Mm -hmm. mm, the, so we installed a Flannel plugin and all this. However, we still uh, trying to do more uh, edge to edge uh, collaboration because uh, sometimes if two edge nodes within a uh, very close in within a, in the subnet or something we want to set up a P2P connections, we may looking for a more complicated cases yeah. that's in our roadmap. But now we only have a simple plugin to support network. Uh -huh. So when you do have this list, is there an installer for the user then where you would fire up an installer and then fill out uh, what your choice is of CNI and the installer puts it in for you? Or is it more manual than that? It's a kind of a manual. It's a more like follow the the Kubernetes. Basically it, it doesn't, um, uh, you can see our doc basically say, okay, go to the Flannel CNI or Clinical CNI, download and install, and uh, then that's it. It's basically manual. It's more like a manual steps. Okay. And if somebody, in terms of community for adding to some of these, um, you know, let's suppose hypothetically that I had my own CNI implementation and I want to fit it into CubeEdge. Is it so open that I wouldn't have to do anything other than write a document on how I did it manually? Or is there some structure there where it would be better if I go to the Cube Edge project and put some kind of a wrapper on my CNI to... Uh, I, I don't think we haven't thought about that, but the, the current situation, we don't need to... Uh, we don't require you to do some code change. It's just uh -huh. write down the, the menu yeah. steps. To replace the uh, final CNI with your CNI is supposed to be working. Okay. The reason I ask that is I've gone through Microcates and they have built in, they, they have an installer or a configuration associated with their snap where you designate which one you want 
but in order to support a new one, you'd have to, you know, you'd best go into their project and enable that as one of the add-ons. No, we don't have that. And uh, we have our installer, actually we have a Debian uh, package. So uh -huh. you can use uh, AppGet or Snap install. But mm -hmm. it's uh, like you said, we don't, we don't have a, a built-in uh, CNI plugin or something. It just open, say, and if you abide, uh, abide by the uh, CNI policy, it's just install another plugin. It should work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Those were, those were the questions I had. Okay. So that's our uh, last year's uh, projection. It's uh, contributors now is uh, more than 300 and uh, from more than 25 uh, companies. And uh, actually the actual checking code, checking the code is, uh, is uh, more than 100 people checking the code to our reports. And uh, it's to keep a steady trend. That's the contribution, the major uh, contribution companies. And also we have uh, uh, English, Chinese, and also Korean uh, website. So if you go to Kubernetes.io, uh, Kube that's uh, a community member that's offered to build a, a Korean version because they are using that. And also we just, uh, ask our another community member to set up a Japanese uh, version of our website because uh, they, we have the uh, community member over there. The, the Sony guys just come, just came last week to, uh, no, two weeks ago to introduce, uh, yes, actually last week, introduce their plan, how to integrate with uh, Kube Edge. Um, there's some user cases. Uh, that's the ETC system. It's basically the the toll system. It's it's a you mm, we you use the, the the video to capture the, the plate number and to charge back to charge to their account. Mm -hmm. So and is uh, this a production use? Yeah, this production is a hardware. It's now the uh, open source version. Is the the Huawei Cloud? They take. Uh, the version, uh, their version, but uh, it's based on the open source too. Is uh, they have add-ons for multi-tenant and also the oh. IM integration. All this stuff is uh, we open, so you can actually you can plug in any IM IM uh, system. However, this is a, a community version already deployed on the uh, Huawei Cloud, so it's called uh, Intelligent Edge Services. I I. IEF or it's Intelligent Edge Fabric. It's uh, the same code base with the uh, uh, enterprise add-on with the IAM multi-tenant. That's the, the two major features they add on. The other one is the how they uh, add a more automatic uh, deployment, the CICD integration or something like that. But they, they come with the, the, home, the same code base and also they also contribute back to the community. Those contributor stats and things look pretty good. Does it look like you, are you expecting this to possibly move out of the sandbox and graduate to the yeah, higher tier we, project? Yes, we talked to Chris uh, Achtet and uh, the, the CTO. Uh -huh. And also we talked to a few uh, TT members. They, uh, they think this uh, looks good. So we are going to start our, uh, we talked to Amy to start our uh, due diligence uh, review and also uh, we are going to have the the seek review because you know now they are require uh, seek to recommend the project first so we are going to go to the the seek meeting to do the presentation it uh, this uh, two days later mm -hmm. the Thursday morning then after that they are going to send a recommendation to the DC for review and then we uh, took uh, the original TC uh, sponsor. They're already willing to uh, help us to get a TC review. And also we talked to Chris, Chris A. He uh -huh. Chris like, Anacek, yeah. Yeah, Anacek, he, 
he look at all the numbers and I don't think he go to the, the technique detail. He, he only look at the contributors and all this. this yeah, I think that's why they elected to go to that process of having the SIGs look it over because there's a lot, there's a lot of deep technical expertise in within those SIGs. So you get developer eyes looking at it in addition to kind of management tier of the foundation eyeballs. Yeah, the foundation only like, oh, how many contributors, how many uh, adopters, uh, and uh, what's your chart? What's the, is it steady or is just the, uh, it, we say, you see, we have the continuous uh, steady the commit and from that. So, yeah, yeah, and they're looking at how many different organizations so it isn't dominated. I think yeah. they have something they call an elephant factor. And yes, yeah, it's so, kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, this in our project, about 40 to 49% from Huawei and all others from other communities. I think ARM contribute about 17% and Samsung or, yeah. And I think China Unicom have another about 20%. That's the, we have about three or four big contributor organizations. And then we have a, a few active individual contributors from uh, university from London and a couple guys from German. When you deploy out at edge, um, do you have any kind of support? You know, an interesting thing when Kubernetes goes on-prem out of a public cloud uh, and something that a cloud provider optionally can do is provide for a load balancer so that you can get a load balancer ingress from your cluster. And have you had anybody wanting to expose something publicly directly from an edge location as opposed to only send it up to the cloud? No, we haven't. I think in the MEC case, we may have this uh, load balancer requirement. Uh-huh. Mm, but we don't have that part yet. And uh, we were thinking uh, for the, for the, uh, from the application side, you can always get a load balancer, right? Uh, because we just use the standard Kubernetes you, uh, the service API to deploy a new service. Then you have a service IP, then you have the load balancer to uh, load balancing across your uh, across your the instance, your application, uh, your pods, right? Mm -hmm. So that one, if it's within a, a small data center, or I mean, within a node, or within a, a class one node within the same area, that's fine. But I we don't think you should uh, load balancing across the whole cloud. I mean, because in in edge cloud computing, we were thinking, why we need that? Because we want to uh, make the computation close to the location that data generated. But if you, I mean, if the data location is in point A and you want to relocate it to a far side of a point B, it doesn't make sense. Why, if that's the case, why not yeah, just go I, back directly I, to I agree cloud? that you don't want these edges to use a load balancer that's up at the public cloud tier. But yeah, then you just you go back to the cloud. It's faster than another edge yeah. location. <laughs> but let's say the use case is something like a retail edge, like a sandwich shop. There might be some utility in deploying some containerized apps at an, a, a sandwich shop location and then exposing them to users, you know, the public. Uh, and you don't want them connecting directly to those cluster nodes. You might want to put a load balancer in front just to protect, protect them from, you know, hits from denial of service and things and have Kubernetes, still have Kubernetes manage the configuration of it uh, and maybe put in place security policies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it'd be an interesting concept. It's something that I, I don't think it, Kubernetes, I think, may assume that the load balancer is up at the that top level rather than many distributed ones out at edge locations. But the concept of having this thing handle those use cases of uh, exposing things behind a facade safely would be interesting. Mm -hmm. So in our case, uh, we uh, actually have that one. It's more like a, a, a community 
surveillance camera things. Uh -huh. So basically that location, because they have a big uh, server, actually two big servers, uh, we deploy multiple instances of one application running within that big server. That server, I believe, have a 24 uh, CPUs and a bunch of a GP, uh, maybe two GPU, uh, a few gig memories. So basically, uh, we deploy uh, the application there, multiple instances, but the load balancer is there because, you know, we just deploy a service running in within that edge node. I think that achieve your goal is just a, if you have a power edge, so you can, I mean, uh, deploy a, I mean, load balancer like uh, services, right? We just use a building in uh, Kubernetes services. So you build, you deploy a uh, a deployment with a three or four instance, but then you deploy a service and you expose that service IP, but that's only available within that uh, lane. So I, I think that's that's the that's I mean working as a your retail edge, the similar thing, right? If you have a, a big server, then you deploy multiple instances, you have a, a built-in service, and you expose service IP instead of expose the individual uh, pod IP. Okay, well, I'll let you go on. I think I've monopolized all the questions yeah, that, here. That's, that's okay. Uh, uh, I think that's good discussion. We may need to think, yeah, but we want to not only uh, technical driven for our community, but also the customer driven. We want to get the real, real world uh, use case to drive our uh, project to get more adoptions. So that's the the, the toll system. Basically, basically, it's more like a uh, like a, a I ninety ninety two uh, bridge ninety two the uh, automatic <coughs> charging system. They have the video camera to capture the uh, the place number and uh, to go back to the cloud to to uh, process, that's the, they said the number is from uh, 15 seconds uh, per car improved to two seconds per car. Uh, this is the uh, smart cameras. Uh, that's, that's interesting uh, cases. That's uh, from a high school or a private high school. So what they do is they, uh, they have the uh, face recognition at the gate. So uh, if, if a, a student entered the, the school gate, they, they take the picture and actually uh, text to their parents say, okay, they uh, safely arrive at school. So, and also uh, they also on the playground, when the people have a, a recess, they take uh, the happy picture sent to their parents <laughs> and say, okay, you are, you're, you're still really happy in our school. I mean. They said that's really uh, the that's fake recognition uh, algorithm. The model must be uh, accurate. You you don't want to send one student picture to another parent. I mean, that's... well, does it all also filter it out so that if there are unhappy moments, it it only <laughs> yeah they, the they, they do that. <laughs> but the the main is uh, they they want to make sure that. The parents get because the parents are busy. I think that the high end, the private school, they they said they uh, they use their. Like, I don't think the parents uh, drive their kids to the school, but uh, maybe uh, the butlers or house helpers to do that. They are not one hundred percent to trust them, or that's why they they do this. Say okay, your kids uh, arrive at school uh, safely or something like that. And in this case. Uh, why they need that? They, they claim if they uh, upload this all high resolution picture up or uh, stream video up to the cloud, they only have a, a, a limited number of bandwidth they, they're using for other stuff. That's why uh, they con constantly update their model from the cloud because that's connect to uh, another AI services to update the model, to do the training, to give them uh, more updates. So that's our release schedule. Is uh, the last year March we entered the sandbox, and June we have 1.0 release, 1.1, 1.3, 1. 
now we are on the uh, three month release cycle. We're following the uh, the upstream Kubernetes release. So we uh, gave about a month after the Kubernetes official release, we gave a month to uh, do the compatible testing and everything. Then we uh, release our uh, our release. So it's a moving train. If you miss this release, just uh, three months later, another feature just catch on the next train. So this the uh, this the future plans. So. <clears throat> uh the community we want more adopters everything and we want to actually uh to have a two focus on our uh, group one is iot the other one is more like mec is a multi access edge that's more like a technical cases is uh, have a relatively much larger resource so a lot of resource constraint will be gone but they're facing other uh problem for example the global dns uh, you need to uh, route your dns i mean route your service uh, easily that's this should be uh, the strong part of a kubernetes but how we uh, integrate this and make it working in the mec cases that's a challenge so we have a couple of china unicorn uh, china mobile and we are looking for other uh, technical providers too <coughs> Uh, contribute together. This, uh, we want to set up a SIG within our group to have a two focus IoT and MEC. Mm, yep, that's about the uh, presentation and I'm going to give you a preview of the, not preview, re go over, let's go over the uh, release. So uh, here you can see actually we have the Korean, Chinese, that's all volunteer from a committee member to build the uh, other version of this. <clears throat> so let me see. So that's the uh, <clears throat> 1.3 at least. So we have a major maintenance uh, improvement so we can uh, log collection from so before this release all the log you need to log into the edge node to collect the uh, the log so all the power log now you can uh, use the kuba control logs to collect all the logs from edge node back to the cloud so you don't need to log into individual edge and we improve the monitoring we have a uh, more the cloud component, you see that the cloud core, we don't rely uh, on the uh, Kubernetes to restart it because it may uh, have issues. It's, it's take uh, longer than expected. It's take a 10 second or 30 second to come back. It's, uh, we got a complaint, we have a more HA deployment method to have a hot standby and it's uh, automatic. Uh, before that, because you wouldn't do it do the deployment, you need to manually set up the, the certificates. We now do the automatic generation. We, from this release, we support a CRIO and the Kata container. So that's more details. It's a pod, uh, we collect pod uh, logs from cloud. So you don't need to log into the edge. We improve the monitor monitoring. Mm, so we can aggregate the, uh, the information into the cloud and the, instead of only depends on uh, Kubernetes to restart our uh, cloud core part, we have a hot standby so we don't have a service interruption on the cloud side 
and all the edge node, we don't need to manually copy the certificates again. We do the automa automated uh, certificate issuing. And we have uh, a more runtime CRIO and a Kata container and other kind of a fix. Yeah. I think that's about it. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, thanks very much for this deep dive. Yep, yeah, thank you. I think any more questions or we can down with this topic, I guess. Even more questions. Just from Steve, Steve, you're muted. Yeah, I, I was just saying, no, I don't have any. I think you, I hit you with a lot of them as you were going along. Cool. I have just one up about uh, device twin. So is device twin uh, the edge only concept or do you have something that, that maps that to the cloud or? Uh, that we, from the cloud side, you also have that metadata. So when you change it from the cloud side, we do the synchronization we synchronize this device twin the metadata from the cloud to the edge. Then the edge, another um, uh, service broker, I mean, not, it's a event bus. And to then you can actually uh, operate the uh, device. And so we, uh, we not only support MQT, actually the GPI, uh, GRPO, uh, GPIO, you can operate that on that too. That's uh, the general purpose IO, it's easy working. Okay, thanks. So uh, I, I see you, uh, it's you and uh, Kilton to submit a uh, topic on, well, I don't know who uh, on the uh, uh, Eclipse Con about this uh, example running, running what, HANO and uh, IO Fog, right? So- Oh yeah, yeah. Can you give an introduction to that one, the case preview? Uh, yeah, I think it might be a little bit, uh, I don't have anything here at the moment, but yeah, we are discussing it uh, uh, extensively. Uh, at the, uh, yeah, you, you guys meeting, meeting in two hours, three hours, yeah. it's pretty long. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we, we're basically trying trying to, to create a, a better integration and, and see uh, uh, to bring more more closer to the two projects and, and, and enhance all the benefits from, from both of them to, to be able to use them in the in the in, in, in the in the more edge, edge scenarios. For example, if, if you take a look at the Hono, it, it all started as a like a IoT cloud gateway. So basically enabling different different kind of devices to, to scalably connect to, to the cloud. But we now more think about it as a, as a, like a device connection API where, you know, it, it doesn't matter if, if the device connects to the cloud or, 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 or the edge. So, so we try to re-architect re some things that this protocol adapter thing ca can be at least deployed uh, on the edge. And, and we are using IOFOG as a as 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 a as a as a perfect uh, edge platform that that we can work with within the uh, Eclipse community. But that was on only only the 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 first first and, and easier part of the integration, like running uh, Hono as an so to say application on, on top of the IOFOG. I think th this second phase we are talking about. And, and Kilton, feel free to, to jump in. If yeah, you're doing great so far. So I haven't <laughs> I haven't wanted to say anything yet, but sure, yeah. I will. So so we covered the yeah. firmware update. I remember the, somebody mentioned that during a meeting, say yeah. the firmware update. Yeah, usually firmware and other artifacts like that are usually delivered ver via Eclipse Hawkbit, which is in the same ecosystem here. Um, yeah. So we also talked about. Having so something with Hawkbit has to implement the actual firmware update process, um, but um, if you use Hawkbit uh, and it, and have implementations for different hardware, 
um, available at the edge or you can start them manually or sorry, automatically and remotely, it becomes really kind of possible to deliver firmware updates for a device maybe that just popped on the network, right? And as long as you have a, a microservice that can do the, the firmware update process, then Hawkbit is the way that you would manage that campaign, right? To like say flash the firmware on a Bluetooth device or something. So there's a lot of potential here, but that means there's a lot of touch points and to work through them all is, well, we're gonna do it the, um, the European way and take our time and get it planned right. And then we're gonna, then we're gonna knock it out of the park. <laughs> so, oh, so you don't do more like a waterfall? instead of a scrum well no i i would say i well i mean it's just that we like to talk we're going to talk through all the different ways that we could figure the implementations uh, and integrations and and then um yeah but uh, no i think uh, everywhere in the world is agile at this point so as uh, dan was saying we did a first pass that was interesting and we showed that at uh, bosch connected world back in the spring right before all the conferences went virtual and, um, and that was just a way to get familiar with what integration might look like. And now we're actually flipping it and it seems more like we might even want to carry the IOFOG traffic over HANO so that it is a reg basically a registered type of traffic that's coming through with all of the, the gateway management that uh, HANO provides. So it's been interesting so far. Yes, so basically instead of having HANO as an as a add-on service on top of the IOFOG, Basically, trying trying to yeah, as Skilton said, to do the other way around and and base the base the IOFOG uh, control plane communication all, all over over the Hono stack, right? And 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 yeah. then you, you can you can see the the edge nodes basically be controlled by 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 the by the rest of the stack. That's one 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 of the one of the reasons I ask for for the you know uh, device uh, twin in in. Uh, in in Qubit and and we I talked with Cindy uh, early on when, when she she was uh, uh, on Qubit and, and and you know tr trying to see you know th there's a lot of uh, device twin projects there and and things like that so so it it might be you know beneficial at some point uh, to talk about how you can open up that for for the wider e ecosystem so maybe maybe we, we can do something there. So the state now, I mean, uh, I thought I heard that CubeEdge had something like Device Twin where they're representing devices, but they're not using the Eclipse project to do it. Is that the summary of the state of it? Yeah. Okay. That is how I get it, yeah. So for the firm update, I mean, how do we handle the rollback and I mean, that everything like that, I mean, that so, so, so different that's, that's from the job of the, that, that's the job of, of, of the Hogbit. So basically Hogbit is, is a rollout manager, so you can do campaigns, you, you can do uh, different kind of things uh, there. But the Hogbit, Hogbit is only a, a trigger to, to do something. And then it's a, it's, it's a device job to implement a proper agent that, that will actually uh, uh, do the update, right? Yeah, if I remember, I mean, the other... OS I'm touching is a they make actually make another fully copy of space. So if this one fails, they actually have a two active system running. That's a that's but, a that's a very good very good technique. Yeah, and you'll even get that with like some um, uh, devices that only only receive their over the air updates like truly over the air like via wireless. They'll have enough uh, memory for storing the prior version of the firmware so that if they fail to restart and establish a connection, they'll revert back to the old firmware, um, allowing you to kind of have a lower risk version of pushing down updates to things that might be are, you know, in a mostly automated warehouse or someplace that's very difficult to go back and fix all of it. But that comes down to the device manufacturer, just as it comes down to like an IoT gateway, right? If you don't implement this separate space for storing another copy of the OS or the firmware or whatever. Um, there's not much you can do to change that, except maybe implement it in the software layer that's delivering it. So right where you would have that Hawkbit client that would be um, uh, talking to like the device over wireless and pushing at the firmware and stuff, um, might be the place where also if it doesn't have an extra copy, you could maybe detect that it doesn't come back online and then it still has to have some kind of an emergency backdoor, right, for, for fixing it if it won't reconnect. So 
I'd say in the end, it comes down to whoever made the device needs to have the foresight to make it robust for firmware updates. And I had consulted a, a wearable company um, uh, some years ago, um, and um, they just before they realized they needed better firmware um, rollback, roll forward capability, they had already shipped in a, a bunch of units that actually had a firmware problem that that related to their connectivity. So basically. Um, you know, to fix it, you would need to get your hands on the physical device and that gets very expensive. So they were basically saying if we were just one release ahead, we would have been able to fix this. But um, <laughs> yeah, so they hadn't thought of that ahead of time, which is when you need yeah. to think. Probably it just shipped a new version and say, give you a free new version instead of the old one. It's cheaper. <laughs> it's much it's cheaper. Honestly, yeah, it's, it's uh, usually a lot cheaper. In the end, I think um, we, tried to, we tried to find some way to hack it so that we could maybe push down an app that, that you could use that would talk to the device, but um, uh, there wasn't really a great way to do it. So in the end, I think it was like you could download software for Windows that would allow you to talk to it and fix it. Otherwise, you needed to ship in your device. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in this internet. So when you lose the connection, basically you can nothing to do from external. Cool. That, that's an interesting topic. I mean, uh, I in a lot of uh, IoT cases, I'm, I got a request from customers say, how do you support a firmware update? I think Hop, Hopbit is a really a good solution. It's, I see, maybe we can integrate it with that too. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yep, definitely. Uh, hey, Dayan, real quick question. There was, I, I saw in, the, uh, in this working group's uh, Slack channel some discussion of there's an event coming up um, and we are, you were being asked if you could present something. Um, did, I, did I miss that? Uh, when is that event? Well, uh, there's, go ahead, are we go. talking about the virtual KubeCons or the... Uh, no, not, it wasn't, it was KubeCon, it was just some oh, other... Oh, the Eclipse? No, so, so, no, so it's... Uh, it's an OpenStack project, project team gatherings. Uh, so they have like a three days uh, of uh, team gatherings between different working groups uh, within the OpenStack and there's the Edge, Edge working group there. So we were asked to join uh, just to see, they, they, were, they wanted to talk about the collaboration between the, the Kubernetes and, and Open, OpenStack working groups. And it, it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, basically uh, a, a mid-European time zone for, for two hours. So I was there on Monday, but there was no talk about any, any, anything about further integrations. They were all, all internal. And yesterday I, I, I joined for an hour. There's also today uh, uh, one session for, for two hours. I can send you, uh, let me try to send you a link. But I think that uh, and, OpenStack and, already closed at the uh, edge group of, and, for a couple of years. Sorry? The, the OpenStack, they, they stopped to have stopped their edge group discussion for about a couple of years. I look at their, their doc, I, I, the, the wiki, they already say that the work group already terminated. Really? And I, wouldn't that, isn't that the, how, the home, the major home of the Starling X project? Right, which no, I it's different. I, the Starling X is, uh, I remember in 2017 in San Francisco, they had a few discussion, but, but then they, uh, they are gone. I think maybe I was wrong. They have an update on, on uh, Starling X on, on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. Cause so I think it's a different one. As well, yeah. So here you, you, you can see there's a meeting today starting in, at 1 p.m. UTC. And uh, yeah, the, the, the guy who originally invited us yesterday asked for if somebody from the Cubage team could join. And, yeah, and Kevin, can you join? Yes, I, I can join. So anything I, I need to do to join that? No, there, there's, uh, you, you need to register, but it's free okay. and, and then you get uh, the Zoom password. But, if, you know, if, if you can't join, ping me and, and, and you know, or, or, or uh, 
gurgly and and we can figure out I'll, I'll probably join for it at least a bit there because it's a it's, it's a two, three hour stretch stretch i don't think we will need to be there the whole time let me also try to find the notes from the first two days Okay. Is, let me let me paste it in the chat as well. Cool. Thank you. Speaking of uh, other conferences, uh, at the end of June, the Open Source Summit virtual event is on, and they have um, they had enough edge centric sessions there that it interested me, and I registered. So I'll put a link to it there, and then you can look over the schedule. Cool. So this one is a code embedded Linux, right? It's not Edge. You mean the one I just linked to? Yeah, it's used. I remember it's used to call Open Source Summit and embedded Linux, right? Well, it it depends. They put these in various po points around the world, and sometimes the name changes slightly. So it often has the Linux people co-located that are in Yakto and things like this. Uh, the Japan version of this conference combines it with automotive Linux, and it, it kind of changes flavor just a little bit. But for Linux Foundation, this probably has more edge-related content than a KubeCon would. Yeah, I, I remember because I, I remember the title was uh, Open Source Summit with Embedded Linux because they have they merged the edge with the uh, uh, networking, they call it open source network, uh, open networking and edge. That's why I think maybe that one have more. Uh, yeah, in the U.S., yeah. I think they fork it into more flavors, or I guess technically it's North America, not I mean, U.S. Check, so maybe I so can... they had open network summit too, I think, uh, that got canceled this year, but they had it. No, but, I don't think they canceled. It's still moving to a networking. A virtual event. Oh, it's going to be a virtual event? Okay. Yeah, but it's going to be in the fall. It's pretty far out. I know I was registered for it in maybe April or something, and it didn't happen, but right. I didn't know they had rescheduled it. Yeah, it's it's pushed out pretty far. But my experience is oh, when they September, go to I other venues, that. they cram together a bunch of these Linux Foundation things into one conference. Yeah, and you, you seem to be right because the, the tracks for the Open Source Summit, Steve, the link that you just sent, mm -hmm. it, looks like, it looks like the Embedded Linux Conference is a, is a small track within it. Not necessarily small, but is a track within it. So yeah. my guess is that the Embedded Linux Conference being virtual is maybe, maybe they had a reduced amount of presentations or something. Yeah, the, probably they reduced the, the name to a track. And also I post that uh, the actual Open Network and the Edge that's how more edge topics over there. Anyway, I, I looked through the schedule on this and I found enough to b find it worth paying the 50 yeah. bucks to register. So yeah, just cool. throwing that out there just to, in case others are interested in this kind of material, you might find something of interest there. Yeah, very cool. Okay. I'm kind of interested in seeing one of these virtual conferences uh, because I'm slated to be a speaker at some of these virtual events later in the year myself. And I know they've got to be different from doing a physical one, but I want to see, you know, I, I figure that I would like to see some examples of it done well before I go up there and try to do it myself. Yeah. Um, I, last week I did a, I presented at an Eclipse event, which was the, um, uh, the IOT and, and Edge Day. And um, it was it was different because I uh, needed to get into the green room, you know, which is a virtual green room. We all know how to get into the you know the speakers room before we go on stage and prepare. Uh -huh. But to do it to do it virtually, um, you know, from essentially what is my like my small home office area, it was very strange. But I would say it was executed really really well because. And although I wasn't sure where I was all of a sudden going to end up, I ended up all of a sudden being able to, you know, share my screen and stuff right at the right time. And I just trusted that everyone could see what they were supposed to see and everyone said it turned out good. So, but it was, it's different because uh, you just don't have the normal cues to even understand that there is an audience out there and all of a sudden 
I, I guess it was a good turnout. It was a hundred plus people from my session. And I just have no idea they're there versus standing on stage and seeing that, you know, people are interested and I, I, you just don't get the visual feedback either of seeing that they know what you're saying or they can't understand you. You just don't know. Yeah. I've seen a few other examples with multiple speakers where, you know, all it takes is somebody to have bandwidth difficulties and it kind of messes up the whole flow of the thing. Yeah. And I can see that happening too. Yeah. Okay, well, we're five minutes after the hour. Um, maybe last call if somebody has any other topics or uh, the other thing I'm always interested in is suggestions for what to cover at the next meeting. Uh, you can pick either the next meeting on the North American cycle or on this one. But, um, you know, so I Steve, think- I, I, I would vote for your home automation. <laughs> <laughs> experience. Okay. Yeah, maybe it will be polished enough. Yeah, yeah, I want to see too. It'd be good, just you know what what you tried and then what you. I'll give you a quick tease right now. If for the, yeah, I mean, if somebody can't stay, feel free to drop. But um, let me just pop it up there. It, sure. Yeah. I I literally had this running an hour ago, so this thing is like. Can you see this? Screen? <laughs> yeah, your screen is on. Okay. Um, so what I've got here, this is actually running literally in my house, but I have something maybe a little unnatural in that, um, I have a, a vSphere hypervisor, I guess it timed out and I logged out, but I'm running, uh, Kubernetes, uh, on top of an ESX hypervisor. So, uh, yeah, it's a plain it's a vanilla Kubernetes. At this. What's that? It is single box. It's a single box, but it's a fairly, yeah, not that I needed that. The, the resources here are not that great here. Let me log in and uh, I'm going to drag this off just while I log in. So I've, I'm running Kubernetes on this and I don't mean to sell a product, but this obviously I work for VMware. So it is the VMware Tanzu. But what I've got is a Kubernetes control plane is on a couple of VMs. And my runtime is actually just a single node uh, worker node for the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, let's see, I think it's this one. So these are actually, these cluster nodes are actually fairly small. Um, yeah, those are the management ones. So I've got the cluster node itself. Uh, let me see if I stretch. I think I can show you what the VM looks like if I make a little room. So it's two CPU cores, four gig of RAM. So in terms of a Kubernetes cluster node, this isn't that big. Uh, two cores and four gig of RAM. So in theory, you could run this on bare metal of this size, just you know, something like a, a low-end x86 uh, with four gig of RAM uh, because that's all I've given for this VM. And this particular uh, distribution of Kubernetes is deploying a load balancer, which is HA proxy running in a VM. And that's kind of what my VM looks like. Now, when I deployed this, I used what's called cube apps, and that's a VMware wrapper that came from v Vietnami that uses a Helm chart. So I went and deployed Home Assistant out of the catalog. And what it pulled was the Helm. This Helm chart is published in the Helm chart repository for the app version 108.7. And the experience of doing that, um, I don't know. I, at, if somebody really cares, I'll save this for next time, but it took about 10 minutes for this thing to be deployed out of Helm chart and actually be running. Um, and uh, I can go to the URL here for the management interface. So I think if I click this, it will open it up. So this is the Home Assistant. And right now this is, it, it actually, when I installed, you go to configuration, 
and integrations. And I installed MQTT. And I've got a Raspberry Pi with um, a Z-Wave USB flash device. It's uh, by Aeon Tech um, called the Z-Stick. And you did set up and more expensive than your uh, server. <laughs> uh, no, I think those Z sticks are 35 no, I mean, bucks. Past, rather, Perry Pi and all these uh, devices, it's more yeah. expensive than, than the server. I, maybe they are, certainly with the switches. So, anyway, when I installed this MQTT integration, it, uh, it asked for the. Um, let me just see if I can get to it. I, I'm kind of new to this thing. So there was a configuration step here on this. But I, and I filled it out to give my mosquito broker credentials. Well, maybe this is it. I don't know. I don't know how to get back to the configuration, but I did it once and it auto discovered my lights. And uh, I'm sitting in my living room now. Let me, let me just see if this is working. I think it is. Yeah. So I'm going to turn out the lights here at my desk so it gets dark. I'm in a corner of this room. And I've got a couple of lights on, but I'll turn them all off. So that light on the other side of the room is going to be where most of this is coming from. And I'll turn a couple of these off. And I don't know if you can tell if it's, if it seems to be getting dark on my face here or not. I think what's happening is the yeah, light from my it. monitor is enough to keep my face lit up, <laughs> even though the room is getting light and dark. But these things are like working and the helm chart deploy took about 10 minutes and i had a working z-wave configuration that i've had in my house for a few years but the home assistant seemed to have found all that stuff and i was really surprised at um, how easy to use the user experience is and i poked around on this and logged in and their architecture is that they are running this in a VM or in a container. They're running it in a container under Kubernetes and that um, that Kubernetes container um, is, is able to host uh, or the pod is able to host multiple instances to do these plugins. So their architecture is that when you load one of these integrations, I think what it's doing is essentially bringing along sidecars that run the integration like MQTT in a sidecar container along with the home assistant itself. And it's an interesting architecture that seems to have a really small footprint where you can run it on a Pi with just two gig of RAM. Uh, yet, I'll show you the available uh, integrations. There appears to be a pretty huge list. So they've got a lot of home automation uh, and entertainment devices in here. Uh, security devices. I think I saw a Modbus in here. So a little bit of industrial IoT devices are mixed in here as well. And it also appears that it will control some network switches, switching and routing equipment that's popular for home use, like a MicroTik and a Ubiquity is in here. Uh, obviously, you see the MQTT, so you'd have real potential to cross this over into kind of a, you know, kind of a disruptive form of uh, industrial automation. I don't know if this is up to it. it. The network UPS tools are something that would get signals out of common UPSs. Um, I think OpenTherm is a temperature controller. 
There's kind of an interesting mix. I think Rain Machine is an irrigation controller. And a lot of consumer electronics, I think I saw Samsung TVs, Panasonic TVs, um, Sonos Audio Systems. And it's, it has feeds from a number of weather services from around the world. There's the Unify for kind of the ubiquity uh, network things. Um, I don't know, you can see the list, but um, like I say, I've just been playing around this with this for a few hours and it looks interesting and you can run it on Kubernetes. So it's cool. I think this qualifies as uh, an edge application for Kubernetes if you chose to host it on Kubernetes instead of Pi bare metal. So anyway, at a future meeting after I've had a few weeks to play around, maybe I can do a more organized presentation than what you, what you're getting here, which is like really ad hoc. Um, I don't know even what these other things are. I think Matt, 